Do you think I should leave that in? <laughs> I'll leave that up to you. All right, fair enough. We'll, f- we'll figure it out in post. No, I actually, the last time there was a Great White in Navarre Beach was like 1981 when they filmed Jaws 2. A little piece of trivia for you guys. Bruce the shark. Now uh, there's pictures of it from the holiday, and you saw right. those old pictures. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I take it you didn't take those. No, I didn't. Mm. It's before my time. And FOMO. FOMO'd out on that too. I missed out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. What's up, you guys? Intro. Joining me here is John Starrett. We're bringing this shit around full circle. Welcome back. Yeah. Good to be here. <laughs> I was asking you before we started recording, and I gotta bring it up again. I was like, dude, we were probably, you're the first person I did a video with. This was, it's crazy. I think it was like four years ago. Yeah, yeah, it was about about four, even maybe five years ago. It's it's so wild, and since then, I mean, I've, I've built no, an it's empire. No, it's four years, because I haven't been shooting uh, for five years. So yeah, it's four years. Yeah. So we, I was so nervous and to be honest with you, to be honest with everybody, like I get real manic sometimes and I was on like, I don't know, like a year long manic streak. Like I was wide open, dude, just everything had to get done immediately, but I didn't really have the confidence as much as I had the desire to do it. So I remember like redoing the intro a couple times. Yeah, we'll say a couple times. What was that? You had like to get the to back background done right too. I remember that was kind of a new thing though. The green screen? Yeah, I wouldn't know what to do. Well, so I mean, was it was it an uncomfortable situation? No. No? Not at all. No. God. Well I'm glad to hear that, because it was you and my buddy Mike Osley, and I just remember being like, Hey, what's up you guys? Oh fuck. You know, but like we got off tangent on UFOs or aliens or Ghosts or ghost aliens. Mm, mm. That's what actually fun. you bring fun. up a good point. It's a fun thing. Like if aliens die, potentially, potentially they'd have ghosts. Mind blown. Mm-hmm. This just things that people don't think about, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Things that people don't think about. Dogs and cats living together. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but you, you and I have known each other. Ah, uh, since middle school. Well, elementary school, but we became buddies in middle school. I know specifically in eighth grade in Miss Chinry's class, yes. but I feel like we've always known each other. Yeah, we yeah. That's that's when we started hanging out. So at that time, we were both in an advanced art class, eighth grade, right before we uh, graduated mm-hmm, to middle school mm-hmm. or to high school. Yeah. What were you pursuing at the time? What was your what was your end game? <sighs> There's no end game. Uh, no, as an eighth grader, you didn't have eighth it all grader, figured out. Uh, no. <laughs> um, I do. I, I do. Gotta say this, Miss Chinnery, I believe she moved to Hawaii, and uh, I've been trying to look her up because she is the one teacher out of you know my entire time in the, the school system that she's the only teacher that inspired me to want to do anything. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, it's a shame that she's probably not going to see this because I think you right. and I had that same experience. <laughs> right, right. So um, she was she was amazing. She she got us into all forms of medium from from sketching to to videography to in, in the nineties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, doing stop animation. <laughs> yeah, that was one Ra- of our projects. Raphael got busted for for doing porn. Oh, was he making GI Joes. GI Joes get busy? Yeah, yeah, yeah some gay porn or something <laughs> like that. But uh, yeah, she was just a she was an awesome teacher, and I do attribute that uh, some things that I did learn with her um, to carry over into what I'm doing now. I've always wanted to do. Um, something creative wise yeah. um but uh, then real life hits you and then you're just like mm, you know you just kind of lose it after a while and uh just fortunate enough to pick it back up or in some way shape or form um if you would have asked me five years ago or, you know if i was going to be a photographer i would never even dream that i was going to be a photographer it's just kind of a weird thing i, I happened to buy um i've always been interested in it um, you know, but we grew up in the film days where it's just like so complicated and you would like, oh, this looks so cool. But then you'd look at it and be like, oh. 
Yeah, and now was, what? This was like hard to do. <laughs> um, and that's like yeah. me being lazy. Uh-huh. And then the digital era comes along and makes it a little easier. Um, or so you would think. It's it's a different different, different skill type set? of thing. I mean, same fundamentals. Same, same fundamentals. It's just. Uh, you know, shooting, taking a picture, composition is is one thing, but then the whole aspect of selling your work nowadays in this digital age, you know, dealing with social media, dealing with, you know, getting your name out there. In the 80s and 90s, you had a a yellow book and, you know, trying to get in magazines and editorials and stuff like that. Nowadays, it's almost easier. It's never been easier to get your word out there, but at the same time, that's where competition comes in. So you got to kind of stand out. You really... And that that was same in the 80s and 90s as well, I'm sure, but uh, even more so nowadays because everybody can go to Best Buy and more cameras are affordable and these these stupid things, you know, everyone thinks they're a photographer. (laughs) And uh, so so there's just a lot more involved. Um, But but yeah, it's uh, I wouldn't change it for the world. It's kind of like thinking back to eighth grade and how how. influential Miss Chimney actually was. Mm-hmm, it was like mm-hmm. my wheelhouse was very much illustration. Yeah, graphics. Uh, I remember you yeah. were doing graphic design or, or wanted to do graphic design. And she introduced us, and it wasn't the first time I'd seen these two movies, but she introduced us to Alien and Jaws, which we had to get yeah, we had, we had to, to get to watch waivers it. for each of them. But she kind of broke it down in terms of, of filmmaking, mm-hmm, composition, mm-hmm, the mm-hmm, way that mm-hmm. the sets were made. Like uh, she was the first person that ever showed us a movie that had me like look at it through a critical lens. Right, right. And to this day, I will say Alien and Jaws are two of my absolute <laughs> favorite, favorite movies. Yeah. They're they're untouchable in a lot of ways. And uh, I remember, I think uh, it took years to come back around to that, but I think that that particular experience had a pretty profound effect on me. Um, going from there and into high school, I kind of pivoted towards the direction of... Uh, We'll say music, but I was not doing very much of it. <laughs> and then it was later on. It's like this rediscovery of that part of yourself that, like, you maybe lose track of. You, you've always had a um, an attraction to movies and stuff like that. I mean, uh, music, everything. I remember when The Crow was out as yeah. a big influencer <laughs> in your life. Huge. Um, among everyone in, in high school and uh, middle school. But... Um, she did. She really did pave the the way to open up to to not just arts and crafts as a typical art teacher would show. She got really just kind of laid it all out there for for us to kind of pick and choose, and that's what kind of helped me um, get just kind of value um, you know the creative aspect of you don't have to do the nine to five thing, and yeah, if you have a creative aspect, you can go out there and do this uh, for a living and, and stuff like that. And somewhere it was always in there, um, but I never believed it till till finally I just had it and uh, decided to take that leap of faith and do it. And and so now that's what I'm doing now. But uh, it is literally a leap of faith every day. You have to like constantly you know motivate yourself to keep going, but. Back uh, to my mania, it. yeah. it's like there's a there's a other side of that coin, yeah, and when right. I crash, I'm just like, oh, everything sucks. Yes. I don't want to do anything. Yes, <laughs> yes <laughs> so exactly. I do. I go through those waves. I mean, it's it's very. Uh, it, I think it's a natural thing for lots of artists. I was trying to kind of think back casually. Are there other people from that class that are doing stuff in the field? Is it just me and you? I don't know. I don't really. I'm gonna be honest. I can't remember many of the people in the class at this point. I know Raphael and uh, Megan remember, Bellahan were in there. I don't remember a lot of stuff from. Well, then high school happened, and then yeah, I don't remember anything <laughs> after that. Uh, it was a big, big lull in memory. Yeah. Um, uh. Uh, due to other extracurricular activities, positive stuff, constructive positive, things, <laughs> good, wholesome things mm, um mm. but yeah i don't know i don't know that uh i'm sure there is somewhere out there maybe hopefully yeah but yeah i, don't I, can't, know. I can't imagine us being the only two people that like I, I don't know maybe maybe it just differs for different people yeah. but thinking about high school i didn't have that teacher like you said that like it, well, first of all uh i did the film festival at pensacon this is a, a story that just now split off 
Um, I did the film festival at Pensacon this year, and there was a woman who made her first film. She did it on iMovie, which a lot of filmmakers right off the bat are going to just completely roll their eyes at that. It's it's very user-friendly, very uh, simple in, in what you're able to do with it. Not a lot of capabilities, but she made this documentary. It was dedicated to her mother because 50 years, I will say 40 years after this particular student uh, had her as a teacher, he wrote her a letter. And it was basically like, Mrs. Chenry, you made a positive influence oh, wow. in my life. I'm doing this thing now. And she ended up winning the uh, audience, uh, the Viewer Choice Award. Really? Because it connects with yeah. people. She actually brought her mother, who's the teacher, who's an elderly mm-hmm. woman at this time. And then she brought the man, who's between 40 and 50, who actually wrote the letter to her. And it was like oh, a cool. big experience for mm-hmm. him, you know? But I just, uh, I, I say that to say that... Um, very cool. A lot of people can relate to, yeah. to that kind of thing. Yeah, of course. But then on the other side of that, it was like... Uh, uh, there was another part of that story. Just kidding. That was the whole story. <laughs> Do you remember what we were talking about before that? Uh... <laughs> All right, we'll move on. It's fine. It's fine. What do you think about this beer? It's pretty good. You like it for real? Yeah, New Belgium's not bad. This episode I'm not is a, not brought to you by New Belgium. I'm not a big IPA drinker, but I like it. What are you a What are you a big drinker of? Mm, I like I like Hefe's. I like oh Hefe yeah, Weizen's. that's my that is my preferred beer. I, I, like I honestly I, like I got IPAs German style Hefeweizens. I wanted to get on your level. Yeah. All the fucking, all the, like, seems like beer drinkers like IPAs, and they got a little yeah, too much bite for me. They do. Beer. They got a little a little hoppiness to them. Mm-hmm. Some are good, but, uh, yeah, this is good. I like, uh, I really like... Uh, You're kind of back fat tire. Right now. Fat tire is good. You're like, it's it's hoppy? Eh, it's, this it's one's good. good. Yeah, 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 sure. Gets the job done. <laughs> <laughs> Priorities. Hold your nose and drink it fast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what else, man? Uh, we were talking before we started recording, and we're not going to tell you guys what we were talking about. Thank you so much for coming by. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we were talking a little bit about the challenges of being a content creator, and how I don't think it matters if you're a model, a photographer, a illustrator, a graphic designer. I think all of these things require online branding which is a totally different skill set mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. well i mean d- you you mentioned it before how you think it's easier to get exposure but it also makes you uh, a fish in a bigger more competitive pond mm-hmm. do you think it's a blessing or a curse a uh, both i kind of look at like for instance instagram is very visually driven i'm gonna try this again do you think it's a blessing or a cur- no i'm just kidding <laughs> please <laughs> <laughs> Blessing in the sense it's it's easy to get your work out there uh-huh. in front of thousands of people, in theory. Um, a curse in the sense that algorithms kind of you know rue the day. Um, and then you then you have uh, you know you have access to all this at your fingertips, inspiration. You can drive from other artists, things like that. Um, but to kind of disenchant with the whole thing in the sense that you know to stay ahead of the algorithm you have to adopt a posting schedule and then it becomes a another routine that you have to implement into your into your workload or or workflow and it's all part of it um needless to say there's thousands of artists out there that are are amazing and, and successful and they don't use you don't even bother with it and kudos to them um with me it's kind of helped um you know get my work out there in front of the people that, you know, I kind of want to attract to see it um, and get the, the jobs that, you know, I'm, I'm more passionate in doing. Um, and that is mostly been through social media. So just curious, who gets, who is more likely to get the job? Is it the mediocre photographer with the really savvy marketing sense or is it the really strong photographer without the applied um, marketing skills? Uh, I think it's the, f- the former, usually. At, at, at least that's kind of what I'm seeing. Um, you know, you, you definitely have to have a sense of marketing um, and savvy on, on how to get out there and do your thing. Um, 
Whereas I've seen a lot of photographers that are just incredible, but they're never, they're not getting the exposure they want. Um, I've actually known, known some to actually give up, which, you know, that, that's kind of funny to, to, you know, like, well, they gave up because of social media, but they weren't getting the notoriety or the attention that they deserved. And they're still doing it, but they're not doing it on a commercial or, or, uh, uh, a level in the sense that they're getting paid for their work. They're still doing their, their thing, but they had to go back to a normal job because they just weren't getting out there. And you don't need social media to get out there. You literally just knock on doors um, and just get your work out there and literally bring it in front of people. And that's what I, I was going to ask because you mentioned like some people can sidestep it. Absolutely, and absolutely. If you can find, because uh, there's so much digital noise, you, noise, you know yeah. what I mean? Mm-hmm, and everybody's mm-hmm. trying to sell you something. It takes nothing to click the heart button on a f- photograph that I like. It's a totally different thing mm-hmm. to buy a print that you've, that you've produced, yeah. that you've taken it and put out there. And I think that <clears throat> in a way, that's the thing that can be very detrimental for photographers specifically is mm-hmm. the minute you put that shit online, Everybody can have a print of it, Everybody. right? Everybody. Well, I mean, t- to a to a degree, I, you can't really print off Instagram. It's so low res. Um, but but you could definitely. Yeah. Thing I'm not seeing much anymore is is um, and I, my Instagram is is mostly stuff that is for the likes. Um, because my Instagram is monetized through different accounts for. Uh, Visit Florida. I do work for them, and I do other work for other travel um, sites throughout throughout the Southeast, and and they like to see that type of stuff. Um, so it's a lot of water, coastal element lifestyle stuff, which I love. I love, um, but I, I'm I, what I see as a whole on Instagram. It's very rare that I come across anything creative um, that I'm just like, wow. Um, I, I feel like. You see one tower in, in China photographed, and then next thing you know, you got all these people going over to photograph that same mm. tower. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or there's, you know, I have a lot of pier shots. You know, it's like, how many times can you photograph a pier um, from different angles and stuff like that? So, um, you know, it, it's just, it's very easy to get caught up in in the the run of the mill cookie cutter photography yeah, yeah. imagery. And um, so it helps to really think outside of the box and, and kind of fall back and do your own thing. Um, in times that I've done that, which I'm doing now, um, but I, you know, I don't really share it a lot because people, um, they like my niche, my underwater stuff. Yeah. And so, so I could post something that's um, non-relative and it's like, uh, so-so. Um, is and it then, John Starrett photography? Is, is it John Starrett? John Starrett photo. Okay, yeah, y'all check yeah. that out on Instagram. Um, and then it's just it's that kind of thing is as uh, there's a lack of uh, creativity out there. Yeah. Um, as a whole, um, even like your your you know big travel photographers, they're all going to the same places and photographing the same things, and and I see a lot of that, and um, so it makes me appreciate it even more when I come across something that's just astounding, something original. Yeah. Um, and uh but like i said i'm guilty of it um i'm guilty of posting to for the likes and stuff Mm -hmm. like that um to help build build my my followers and and things like that but uh it's all part of it um if you kind of zoom out though and you apply that same kind of uh that same you apply the same uh belief to all different mediums like they don't call uh instagram influencers they call them that for a reason, right. and it's like, okay, so Kylie Jenner decides what shade of lipstick sure. to wear, and sure. then everybody else goes and buys mm-hmm. that color of yeah, lipstick. Yeah, absolutely. So there will be a lot of emulation in it, I'd imagine, and uh, I, I can see how that in itself would be challenging, but I think something that I've noticed, um, again, speaking from somebody who doesn't know a whole lot about photography, but you, you do like really prolonged exposures, like when you're doing night sky stuff mm-hmm. to where your freaking sky it's pops. And then you do really cool things with like uh, 
artificial lighting mm -hmm. that I don't see a lot of other photographers doing. As he said, a sunset is very pretty. You can't do anything that's not natural light yeah. in a sunset. So, yeah. But you're actually uh, experimenting with technique as opposed to just trying to capture a subject. Well, in my imagery, um, because we live in such a saturated area, and um, I mean, there's more photographers here than landscaping companies. It's, it's <laughs> crazy. It's... Uh, you really have to, it really helps to think outside of the box. Um, to take something that we see every day and, and you know, put a whole different spin on it. Uh, and you can, you can utilize that or do that by, you know, low light. You can make something look completely um, different because people aren't seeing that during the dark. Mm -hmm. And so by light painting or long exposure, you can really tweak it and make it look uh like something new mm -hmm. um and so that's the aspect or, or that's that's my goal is with a lot of my imagery is to take something we see um daily and and make it look brand new uh, and refreshing um and that's in another sense what i do with my water stuff there's so many people that that live here um I, I hear it all the time. It's like that's why i don't go in the water the shark thing like when they heard about the shark that's why i don't go in the water but uh, although they're missing out, yeah. you know, when they see my imagery, they're like, "Oh my God, that's their I feel, vicarious experience." I feel experience. like you know, I'm, I'm glad you were out there and, yeah. and, and were able to do this because I don't go swimming or I don't do this, and or my health doesn't allow me to go out there anymore. Right. So that or gives I live me, in some landlocked sure, state or whatever. That gives me a sense of motivation mm -hmm. um, to to do stuff like that for folks, um, and uh, so. And, and that's a passion of mine is is underwater and um you know uh marine life locally things like that well in a way if i'm not mistaken i can't speak for you but um you started videography out of uh, essentially capturing the moment that you were having and then you just kind of started sharing it out yeah uh yeah. So, <clears throat> to clarify, John started off kind of doing uh, springs. Uh, you would do videography in swings where you're kind of just free diving. Mm -hmm. oh, is that what you mm -hmm. call it? You yeah. not, you're not even snorkeling, I don't think, right? No, I am. Free diving is a word that, a term that gets thrown around way, way too often. Um, it's extremely dangerous, true free diving. Um, and uh, the, the term is thrown around so much. I, I know so many people are oh, free diving today, or free dive. Um, it's not snorkeling. Um, yes and no. Free diving is, is static apnea. It's, you're, you're holding your breath for long periods of time. Uh, minutes, minutes uh, on end. And um, it takes a lot of uh, concentration, meditation. Um, and, and you're also utilizing different equipment. You're using long, long free dive blades, uh, a weight belt adjusted to your body weight. Um, and it's not something you can learn by reading a book, you you literally should you really should take a course, which they are offered, because um, free diving can literally be the most dangerous sport in the world, uh, but with the proper training, it can be the, the safest sport. Um, I had a shallow water blackout because I thought I knew how to do it. Uh -huh. I was like, oh, I watched a YouTube video. <laughs> I read a like book. Like a pro. Just you know whatever. But at Vortex, I, Vortex Springs, I had a shallow water blackout. Almost died. My daughter was there. You know, mm. they're dragging me up on the thing and, and like it was just a it was a, it, well, after there's that there's a story yeah. hold on hold on let's not skim past that what happened dude how did that happen well uh, you know it's uh, free diving I, I bought some free dive fins off Amazon you watched how many minutes of YouTube uh, video well a lot but I'm oh, like man. oh you know I've always been able to hold my breath long time um, how but, long you know, a minute. Uh, that's a that's long time. That's not a long time. That's but not a long time. Relatively. I thought was a long okay, time. Okay. Like, oh, I can do this. You uh -huh. know, oh, I, 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 whatever. And How do you and, think that would be for podcast? Me and you have a breath-holding contest, and they get stuck for like a minute, just dead silence. Yeah, we'll do it afterwards. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, anyway, I was at Vortex Springs and uh, was down deep. Um, didn't do a correct breathing technique uh didn't do a quick breath a correct breath hold and uh no breathe ups anything like that and went down came up about five i, I had my weight belt over overweighted i had way too much weight on there uh which i see a lot and um had a shallow water blackout 
And, Which is? Um, God. Um, I mean, you, you black out in shallow you, you, water? You, you, I don't know. <laughs> I can't explain it right now. Um, is it like the bins? Is it from coming no, up? No, you don't, you don't have artificial... Um, oxygen in your blood from from scuba system so it's not like the bends it's literally just you've depleted all of your oxygen okay you take a breath hold and uh you've used up all your oxygen so your brain doesn't have any more oxygen okay and so you literally just pass out okay and uh it's it's because you're rising the surface um the closer you get to the surface that's when you're you're it's sapped all your oxygen is sapped and you have what's called a shallow water blackout and I did have a blackout and sank like a rock. Luckily, a scuba diver was oh, coming back shit. up. He removed my belt, brought me back up, gave me CPR, and and, and here I am. Uh, after that, I went and, and signed up for the level one free diver course, which is out of Destin. Um, and that's that's your your entry level course. And they it, they guarantee a three minute breath hold, sixty five feet um, on one breath, and that kind of thing. And so I did that. Um, I don't dive deep. Um, I can, um, uh, but but the main reason I free dive is is it allows me to uh, visit or or observe marine life on their level, like sea turtles, for instance. I don't have to bubbles are are just simply unnatural in the marine world. Um, bubbles freak them out, and um, I don't have that big Darth Vader noise underwater. Mm-hmm. You know, p- bubbles everywhere. And so you can pace with the long blades. You're able to pace, pace their, match their speeds to some degree. Um, they can fly, they fly really fast. But you can pace, and you can approach them without spooking them uh, while free diving, uh, among other other things. But uh, yeah, so after that, I uh, took that course, and I suggest anybody that's interested or serious about it take the course before, you know, um, messing around and, and just not doing it correctly. It <laughs> so kill watching you. a couple YouTube um, videos. Underwater, you know, whether you're 20 feet, 30 feet, 50 feet, you have zero chance, zero, zero room for mistakes. Mm-hmm. You make one mistake, it's over like that. Um, Solo, uh, the rock climbing movie. Free Solo. You know, Free Solo mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. amazing. I got to watch it. Um, and I don't want to take away anything that he's doing because I would not never, ever do that. But free diving is a lot like that. Um, expect not necessarily what I'm doing because I'm 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 not real deep when I'm doing my photography. I use a lot of natural light underwater. Um, I don't have big strobes, so I'm not very deep. Um, but for f- professional free divers that are going 400 feet down, um, professional free divers are going 400 feet mm-hmm. down. Yeah. Oh man! Yeah. Um, and they're not they're not doing photography. They're they're literally doing breath holds, and it's a sport. Um, but that is like free solo. It's like it's like climbing without a rope or diving without a tank. I mean, yeah, it's literally yeah. diving without a tank. Sure. One mess up, you don't time it right, um, you run out of air, and boom, that's it. You know, you're you're not seen from again. So, so it's just one of those things. Um, it's just a tool in my kit that I use um, to do what I do and and, and try to do it well. So and you safely. had no intention at that point. You weren't still looking at the videography or the GoPro aspect of it, or did you already started doing that? No, then? no you, correct. Um, that's why I got a GoPro because I was diving more and more, mm. and I was seeing things underwater that man, it would be so cool to bring back to the surface and show. You know, oh look, you know, look at this fish or this little path I took or you know that kind of thing. Um, and at that time, after I got first certified, I was doing very deep dives. I was doing a lot of deep dives, and that's the GoPro would go down deep with me, and I do a lot of video. So vortex, I think, at its shallowest deep points, like fifty feet, and then the, upwards the of spring, about one fifty. The spring is like fifty feet, but down in the cave, it goes on and on and on. And when you're free diving, how deep are we talking? I would just go into the main cavern, so about 60, 50, oh, 60 feet. Oh, shit, that's wild. In, right. 50 feet down, and then you go in. Uh-huh. So it's, it's, the depth is about 50 feet. And then Morrison Springs is about, um, it's another, it's about 50 feet or so. So we're not talking anything too crazy, but, but to get down there in the caverns and show around and stuff like that, that's where the, the GoPro came in handy. And um, then, of course, I started doing stills on the GoPro and shared on social media, and then other folks throughout the state we're like, this is really good. Can I? Can, do you sell your work? Do you have a website? Blah blah blah. I'm like, no, I, I, I never even thought about it. Yeah, yeah. Never thought about that aspect. 
Um, and then I started doing more. Um, and with free dive fins, I was able to pace with turtles and and um, I think it was I sold a I sold a canvas to the Baltimore Aquarium um, in one of their marine biology scientists offices. They hung it up in their office, and this is going in blah blah blah. And that's when it finally like, and I had to scramble around like how to figure out how to print, you know, twelve megapixel pixel picture from a GoPro on a canvas. Like I didn't know anything. You sold it to them with the GoPro. It was taken with a GoPro. Photo. Yeah. Wow. A lot of my original work was mm-hmm. with the GoPro because mm-hmm. I couldn't afford a housing and a DSLR. Um, so that's what kind of started it. And I had this delusion of grandeur, like, oh, I can quit my job and and. Uh, be a photographer, yeah, kind of yeah, like yeah. you know, with people with cell phones now. Like, oh, I can be, I can be a photographer. I don't need it's a some asshole with a yeti. Yeah, you know, thinks well, I, can be a I, I literally hear sometimes like, oh, we love your wedding photography, but my sister's got a good cell phone. So, uh, have you ever punched anybody for that? No, Just, in my mind, ah! yes, in my mind, <laughs> uh, in my mind, I carry around AK forty seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, then the, you know, after after time, I was like, you know, I really want to get a real camera. Um, a DSLR and, and play around with that. Finally bought one as a Canon 70D. Sat the, once I read the user manual, it's like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm never, doing. Never, never read the manuals, guys. Never read them. They'll <laughs> intimidate you. So so it sat in the box for two weeks and then out of necessity, um, couldn't get my job back. I, I figured I had to shit or get off the pot and... Mm. Uh, Got with a wedding guy out of Destin, shadowed him for a little bit, learned weddings, and then the rest is history. Just learned everything I could through YouTube, um, shadowing other people, um, ones that were, you know, great, uh, gracious enough to let me, um, you know, work with them, and they kind of, you know, mentored me and showed me how to do things, and uh, the rest just kind of took off from there. And to subsidize my income, I would do weddings. Started trickling family portraits, fine art sales, um, but all all f- to keep going on adventures and, and doing spring photography, conservation based photography, and uh, had you bought housing or casing for your DSLR so that you could take it into the water with you, or were you still using the GoPro at uh, that point? GoPro for a long time, up until just uh, about a year, two years ago. Mm. Um, there's a company called Real Aldix. Aldix out there. It's kind of like a, a big condom that you put over your camera, and it's got gaskets for the lens and gasket for the back end. Uh, it's like a double-ended bladder that goes over your camera. So I rocked that thing for a little bit. It's a great product. Um, I'm, for I'm, the price point? For the price point. You yeah. just got to be very, very careful and diligent. Like, you can't skip any steps. It's Sounds not like, scary. And it's scary. It's not <laughs> like you just roll up and grab it and go in the water you have to it, it's a process and as long as you do that I your camera will be works. okay it doesn't go Oops. deep you can't go very deep with it but it got me shots and it got me work out there and then eventually um i, I got a aquatech housing uh which is considered a surf housing because it doesn't go very deep but i don't go very deep with my photography um so it gets the job done uh and does does quite well i can put my my canon 5d in there and uh it, it works just fine. So that's what I'm using now. So I'm going to go ahead and show a slideshow, and I want you to just tell us the settings for each of these pictures. <laughs> don't do that to me. <laughs> Did you have to pull back? Did you start off just going crazy in post, as we would call post-production, after you took the photo? Or have you always tried to capture it all in frame and then do as little but what was essential afterwards? Um, I've always had kind of a natural approach. Of course, when I was first learning, and I'm still learning, my style is still going is still in the phases of continue. I've only been doing this professionally for three years, um, and it's constantly kind of evolving. Um, I try to have a very natural approach. Um, modern day photography, uh, digital photography, is is very is uh, really uh, become in a sense kind of not all the time, but it can be a lying experience. Um, there's folks out there where, where it's like, oh my God, it's an incredible photo. It's it's a photograph, um, but it's also like composited, fifty photographs, yeah, um, yeah. all composited, mm-hmm. and that actually never took place. It's basically just a, a computer. It's a green screen, basically, yeah. 
and compositing um, for those of you who don't there, know there's it's taking multiple there's big, pictures and layer them over right each other. layers and layers like a giant moon and a, a tornado and a you know the, the pyramids and it's <laughs> snowing and, and there's flamingos you know uh, the, that's fine like I said art it's all subjective that's not what I do um, I I do very a kind of a minimalist approach to my mm. editing style um, it's it's more or less journalistic. Um, uh, more editorial. It's uh, you just have to check it out. Try to perfect non-perfection with my photography um, and in any ones. It's uh, it doesn't have to be perfect, um, but there are fundamentals that you do want to follow. Um, Without getting super deep into technique, because we don't want it to be inside baseball. Sure. But okay, you want to start photography. What are the three most important, just basic bitch oh, rules Jesus. of photography? This is giving me so much trouble. Um, everyone's gonna have have their own opinions on that. Well, they don't have. I a will say this. Tom. I will. I will say this. Um, it's not the camera. It's not the equipment. Um, a lot of people like gearheads out there. Like, oh my god, if you don't have the. 1DX mark, blah, blah, blah. You can't take that, you know, you can't take a good photo. Or you got to have the, the latest, the newest, blah, blah, blah. You can literally get an entry level camera with a kit lens, that the lens that comes with the camera. Um, I suggest always go for glass over camera bodies. And Canon over Nikon because yes. of the universal lenses. Yes, yes. Can right. Canon's where it's at. Um, Sony's pretty good too. Um, I'm hearing good things about their new cameras. Uh, then, if you're a street photographer, you always want to get a Leica. So it just depends what you're doing. Sure. Um, but uh, it's not the camera. It's not the equipment. It's the mind and eye behind it. Um, that's where your composition lies. And composition, I believe, is everything. Um, however, if you're going to take a beautiful landscape, the number one rule is make sure the damn or the horizon straight. <laughs> I see so many people that have been doing photography for so long, longer than I have, and their horizons are still not straight, which is the easiest thing in the world to straighten a, a horizon. Does but that's it my take number the one priority tip. over subject? It, it kind of does. In my okay, mind. okay. Because <laughs> it's like you're not going to, you know, t build, sculpt a giant, you know, uh, um, beautiful statue and leave tick marks in it you know you, you it's just little things you do to make it great oh, that's important yeah uh, it's it's just an, an importance unless it's like a dutch angle it's supposed to be you know all out of whack yeah or yeah dutch angle is very popular a sport shot you know <laughs> and a guy's flying through the air you don't have to make you know there's there's different things you can tweak but landscape straighten your horizon okay yeah yeah, it's good, good um, enough. that's my biggest pet peeve uh -huh. but um but it, it it really it really does boil down to um the mind and I behind it and, and make what you have work for you. For years I used a GoPro and, and my I literally have a GoPro shot hanging in the Baltimore Aquarium. Um, I have I have artwork hanging in Sacred Heart Hospitals and clinics throughout the Panhandle and some of the shots that they purchased were GoPro shots. Um, so you can't print really big on a GoPro, but nonetheless, there are, are pictures in there you couldn't even tell they were taken with a GoPro. So I, I used a GoPro out of necessity because I couldn't afford you know the $3,000 to put my other $3,000 camera in. Um, so so it's, it all boils down to, and I, I know a lot of people that were discouraged. I was discouraged in the beginning too. I was like, man, I'd love to do that, but I just can't afford it. Yeah, for the, sure. The, 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 sh the shit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I realized it's not about that. And that's where editing software comes into play. I think you pay twenty bucks a month, and you get the whole, the whole Creative Cloud through Adobe for twenty bucks a month, and uh, you got Photoshop, what? Lightroom, and then then if doesn't really matter what camera, to an extent. I'm paying fifty two dollars a month for what. What you just said, and then audition and uh, well, premiere I, and I think after premiere events. and stuff's a little extra. Okay. The video editing stuff's a little extra. Okay. I'm talking about photography. I was gonna say slide it's me. a little extra. <laughs> All right. The video stuff. Uh, I can't as stand as I know. that shit. I think about pirating. <laughs> be real honest. I know, right? Why are we gonna pay for this crap? It's like you used to be able to own stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, not anymore. You buy individually, I think, for two hundred thirty bucks a pop. Like, Can you just? individually all right. and, and so it all kind of it levels out but yeah 
Uh, that's that's it. Horizon lines. Horizon lines. It's the only thing you guys need to worry about. Composition <laughs> and uh, the rule of thirds is like, that a thing? Rule of thirds is is a thing. You definitely want to uh, you know check your rules of thirds and which uh, okay so if you've got a frame uh, or excuse me if you've got your uh viewfinder there's the center section but then you've got it divided into nine equal pieces you've got three across the top three down obviously in that way and you want to kind of put your subject in one of those thirds Right. But that's, again, you said rules are meant to be broken. You, if you're going for symmetry, obviously right, the right. rule it's, of thirds all, doesn't apply. It's all what you want the photo to convey. Um, twist it up. You know, if every one of your photographs has everything dead center, um, it might be time to twist it up and put it on one of those those uh, grid lines to kind of twist it up. Um you know, and don't be afraid to crop your photos. You know, if you that's take, a really good take point. An I do image, a video, um, video too. You be, don't be afraid to crop it to make it a little bit more personal or more in your face. And you would um, say like it's that. not it's not a it's not negating your skills to feel like getting more is better than not, not getting enough. No, not at all. And I mean, one would say, oh well, you should always get it right in camera. This is true. Try to always get it right in camera. But on a photo shoot, or in a sense like you're trying to pace with a sea turtle swimming, you know, tw you know, 10, 20 feet down, you're not going to be able to like think that along, uh, you know, along those lines all the time, or, or, or have that opportunity to get it all right in camera. And that's yeah, where editing yeah. comes into play. Sure. And that's cropping and straightening and stuff like that. So, and that's that's exactly what people would, you know, you'd do in, in film days. You'd go in your dark room and and work. And get it right and, and bring it out so it's really what you want to convey to the world um, and that's me personally that's why I, I kind of have a minimalistic approach to what I do with with my my work whether it be weddings or portrait work or or lifestyle work or fine art it's kind of minimalist stuff what what time in this process did you say I'm a photographer I still don't think that sometimes. No, but you, um, did you maybe before, like right when you started, and then you feel like maybe you started being I, more critical? Yes, or? when I first started, I was like, ah, oh, man, this is, this. I, you know, I, I got a little, I wouldn't say cocky, but I got a little ahead of myself. And I was you like, were excited oh, about the oh, fact you were doing this, it. I'm doing it. I just, uh -huh. got, I just got a paycheck for doing this. <laughs> like, oh, suckers. Uh-huh. Um, but then I realized uh, after working with some true professionals and seeing their work, I was, I was humbled and realized, wow, uh, I have a ton, a ton to learn. And, and it's still uh, still learning and finding the time to learn. Um, just Photoshop alone is endless. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, like I said earlier, if you're not if you're not growing, you're dying. And so you have to constantly find the motivation to grow and continue to evolve and take the time to 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 make that happen, um, and so I have to force myself to st stop and kind of reel myself in and and take the time to for literally days of learning and and uh, experimenting and stuff like that. Um, my my editing style is minimalist, but at the same time it, it is evolving to a sense um, where you know you kind of want all your eventually you want all your work to kind of look aesthetically the same. That way someone can say that's a that's a you know, like uh, that's a John Starrett photo, or that's a, you know. Um, so just in layman's terms, mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to have like, again, layman's terms, a sepia tone picture next to a really high saturation sure, contrast sure. picture. Is that mm -hmm. what you mean? Yeah, like on Instagram, you don't you're using like people that use filters. Like one day it's, it's just a big grid of different looking photos, and you can't tell. Who took it? Or it's so, not a signature or something. Right. Exactly. Interesting. So, so like Ansel Adams, you can look at it. Ansel Adams. Everyone knows Ansel Adams for sake of mentioning, you know, f f famous landscape photographer. Shout out to Miss Henry. And uh, <laughs> you can look at his work and be, oh, that's that's Ansel Adams, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, and that goes with everyone from for, to nowadays, you know. Like uh, you can look at their work and be like. Um, that's so and so. However, if like in, you're in a commercial environment, um, you know you're doing your personal stuff, but then you get a job. Say, um, say these folks want to hire you, and they have their own idea and aesthetic. You're going to please them, 
so your work for them is going to look different from your work. Of course, yeah, that's so, a really so valid, so that's valid. that's a thing hmm. I see like um, um, a really incredible photographer um, locally and, and everywhere. His name is uh, Sean Murphy. Um, he sh- he just shot the black and the teal album for Weezer. What? Yeah. Okay. Um, he actually lives. He's got out of L.A. and he, he he's from Fort Walton Beach. Um, and uh, chalk to high school, everything, and uh, he's uh, he does all the boats um, content. So anything you've seen of boat stand up paddleboard company, yeah, that's yeah. that's his stuff, and that's kind of where he drives his passion from from travel or uh, lifestyle photography, adventure photography. But he's literally shot bands for the past two decades. Um, he shot Green Day, Kid Rock, Christine Aguilera. I mean, some of the most iconic images. Um, that you've seen growing up in the 90s in the the music magazines, he's done. That's wild. Um, Tenacious D, you know, the pick of destiny, the, yeah. the photo. He, he what? Did, he did that. That's um, crazy. Humble dude, love you, Sean, if you ever see this. Um, I'm I hope, sorry, I hope Sean. you don't. Yeah. Um, but, but my point with bringing him up, he's a prime example of, he's got his kind of own aesthetic, but then if he's shooting something like, say, Febreze, he did a big ad spot for Febreze. Um, he's got a cool photo, but you would never realize, like, oh, that's a Sean Murphy photo because it looks it's, it's about tailored the brand, for the client, not about the right. Artist. And so, so you have to know when to step away from yourself and tailor for for the client. Yeah, and that's yeah. what gets you know, and that's that's what kind of differentiates um, professionals from from the the run of the mill. And uh, he certainly is top top professional. But um, so so things like that are something that. That I've just not even scratched the surface, but I'm always intrigued by and learning and, and watching how people like that tick and work um, to see, um, you know, how to get to where, kind of where they're at. Maybe not right along those lines. Like I'm still trying to figure it out, kind of what I want to do. Um, I feel like I started this game a little late. Uh, you know, yeah, you're looking you're at old. forty. But uh, looking at forty, thirty six. I'm thirty six. But come on, uh, yeah, dude. I, I'm, I'm Too like much I, dead. I, I do feel like pressure. Like man, I gotta figure it out. Mm. I gotta figure it out. There's no, ca- kids it. younger than me that are killing it. I know. Um, but There's at the same time, kids younger than me that are governors and shit. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> what? <laughs> but so with that being said, I, I gotta get out of that and and just reel back in and realize I'm doing what I love. And I do lo- love what I'm doing, and uh, and just living living it. You know? One of my favorite things about this whole uh, kind of conversation series has been I've not had to talk about myself at all, and, and I, I just, hate talking about myself. I know. <laughs> I'm like sweating over here, like. Ugh. <laughs> Turn the fucking light towards you. I don't want to explain a shallow water blackout because there's uh, there's gonna be some one. some couch commando. Oh, that's not true. Um, actually, I'll tell him to fuck off. Don't worry about it, dude. I I'm experienced in that by now. I'm, I'm I'm brain dead at the end of the day. But that is my vivance has worn off. <laughs> that is one thing that I can uh, speak to from my personal experience. Is like, at first, I felt so beholden to the algorithm. Like that is something across platforms. It's like there's what's called YouTube U, you, where you can go and learn. You can be programmed to be a good little soldier, which uh-huh. I believe is like a good little consumer where uh-huh. you have to hit certain time marks. You've got to do the uh, Patreon and make sure you smash that like button followed by click the bell to enable notifications and fucking blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it's cool. And I understand that that path led a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But then it's like, how real to what I'm doing is that? What is the most important to me? Is it being passionate about what I do and hoping for the best? Or is it about doing what I heard that other people did to succeed and hoping for the best? I'd rather carve my own niche. So the past couple of years, everything's been way less formal, for mm-hmm. better or worse. You sure. know, I'm sure the algorithm would say otherwise. But like at some point, you just have to say, yeah. what is it that you're in it for? And mm-hmm. ultimately, like I value the conversation. Like we said, like mm-hmm. everything is so um, so digital now, at least in my world, that I, I, I like the fact that everybody's accessible. But in a way, it means that we all kind of like pull back 
to be accessible. Like I could reach you anytime via messenger, but yeah. like having the like one on one time, mm-hmm. like I value that shit. Yes, it's, it's old school. You know what it I mean? Is. And that's one of my favorite things about the medium of podcasting. But I feel like authenticity in itself is it, it, it's a commodity and it's something that people overlook. Like they they are and we as a society are so concerned with image and this this uh, shiny uh, polished exterior mm-hmm. that we forget that like we're all organic like we're all this, messy this likes and, and gratitude society we've be- yeah we've we've become um, and and I've I've even fallen trapped to it you know in the sense that I've I've reached out to different companies I want to create for and and uh, they don't even look at your your work. They just look at your how many followers you got. Well, we can't. We don't do work for anybody with less than ten k followers. Are but, you reaching out to them? Sorry, but with are that, you reaching out to them via Instagram? Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, and like I said, in the past, I've fallen for that. Like what? But then you get over. You you realize. Oh my God! It's not. That's not real life. And yeah. To yeah. some, it is. But but in my my world, it's it. it it, it you you can't let that be be a, a dictation on on whether or not you you move forward or whatever sideways back whatever you want to do with it's it's literally whatever you want to do just go out and do it um yeah and know, no kind of know what you want and and that's that's something hard in itself is is I've never really truly had to sit down and ask myself like I've always thought I've known what I want like oh I want I want a new surfboard or I want those new, I want that new wetsuit. It's a little material thing. But in the end, like when you finally sit down and, and ask yourself, what do you truly want? Uh, it's actually a tough question uh, for yeah. me anyway. No, a hundred percent. And um, that whole, the whole verbiage, you know, be careful what you wish for or, or want. It's, it is a true thing. It's like uh, when I first started this, I thought I wanted this. And then before I knew it, I was doing weddings. I did, I did 68 weddings in 2017. And you were fantastic at it, but you did not love it. I did not love it. I did not love it. Did and you like it? I didn't it? have time. I didn't have time. I had money, but I didn't have time. And then before I knew it, I realized I'm just working another job. Um, and it didn't feel like I wasn't passionate about it. Granted, like some people would be like, well, dude, you had a camera in your hand. And, you yeah. were playing in a band, but it was a cover band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're still in a band. You yeah, know, you're yeah, still yeah. you're still a photographer, and which I get you that. Go out there I and get fucking that. thrust your pelvis so, up and so I don't want to these faces, <laughs> right? All right. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't want to get too negative, but in the sense, it just goes back to saying, you know, know what you want and pursue that avenue, and don't don't deviate from the process. Uh, stick within your skill set. Um, what do you think about people like that may have like, I mean, like, I think what happened with me is I went all in thinking that it was sustainable and then like pulling back may be difficult sometimes. So if I could give advice to people, it's like start at a pace that you feel can be sustainable. If it means once a week, if it means once every three days, whatever that thing that you can hold yourself accountable for mm-hmm. without like, because if you're hitting them hard, if you're fucking posting five photos a day or you're posting a, two videos every single day and then all of a sudden we're three months down the road mm-hmm. and I'm only posting a video every week, mm-hmm. you lose the, the ground that you've gained in a lot of, I, I mean, in, in my experience. In a, Yeah, in a sense, absolutely. Um, I know, you know, I... I'll go out and I, I like dark stuff, mm. um, darker, darker stuff, uh, like imagery. Um, nobody wants to see that. That's not true. On my Instagram, my follower base, they're following me for my underwater, sunny, bright, Florida, sunshine mm. stuff. But there's a market out there somewhere, a huge market. There's There's billions of people in this world. They just haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah. And so you have to remind yourself of that. Like, oh, well, nobody likes this. It's, you know, fuck the likes. It's not about the likes. It's it's about what makes you happy and what makes you grow as a creator, as an artist. Yeah, and, I agree. And you you have to get over that. But in the sense, if do you, you know if you've monetized it or it is you become your living, you do have to be careful. And that's why my Instagram is is more or less. The underwater, the sunshine stuff, because it is monetized. It's it's become um, my brand. 
Um, needless to say, I, it doesn't mean I don't go out and create what I want, which I do, um, but I do it for me. I don't do it for the likes. I don't do it for, for posterity. I don't do it for, for you know, the gratification. I, I just know that I have some stuff I'm very proud of that not everybody gets to see, and I kind of like that. Um, because the, the passion is always there, whether I'm underwater or, um, shooting a portrait or, or, and, 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 and that's where I've come to after that one year of weddings, I got a little negative. I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, I hate this. Yeah, yeah. But then I realized like, man, I'm, I'm still a photographer and mm-hmm. there's people. And I know a lot of people that have not been able to take that leap of faith. Um, there's some really good artists locally that are, are like, wow, you're incredible. But they're like, man, I just I can't leave my job because I'm, you know, I just don't know how to make it work. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so with that, what I don't know what I'm doing is right. I just know what I do. I've made it work. That's how I stay with a camera in my hand. I kind of do a little bit of everything. Literally yesterday I was shooting real estate. Um um, tomorrow I'm shooting, uh, a new mother and her baby's portraits. Um, Wednesday I'm shooting Starfucker at vinyl. Um, is that a band? Yeah. Star big, FKR. Is big the... Marilyn Manson fans? No, they're, uh, like, uh, indie tech weird. Should I come to it? It's awesome. It sounds kind of cool. It's awesome. Star yeah. FKR. But, um... So I literally do everything, um, and you can't just have one means of revenue. Like I have my fine art sales, I have my real estate uh, photography, I have weddings, I have, and so I just got little things trickling in. In theory, no, I mean you're kind of killing it. Uh, it's a struggle. It's a constant hustle. If if I stop for one day, I see a dip in in my bank. My, bank account so do you think instead of struggle. being introspective if you were just an arrogant douchebag that you would do better <laughs> like i got you like whatever you want no doubt in my mind i do everything the best uh i don't know I'm, i I feel like you were kind of applauding me no i, I, I was kind of like i don't know <laughs> um i i i hate to say it but i know that's probably worked for some people some people can do that Literally, there's you know people out there that that are using their cell phones mm. um, that don't even own a computer that are picking up jobs. <laughs> um, that it just blows my mind. Can you imagine showing up to a gig, being like, "I got you." I hope these wedding photos turn <laughs> out good. It and 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 sadly, people don't know the difference. Um, a, a lot of people people don't realize the the difference. Um, so, so I'm sh- that might work for some people. Um, me, I, I try to stick within my skill set. I'm a firm believer is you get what you're ready for. Mm. Um, you're not going to get anything that you're not ready for. Um, and that's been true in the sense I haven't been handed anything that's been over my head yet. Um, I've done done a couple of jobs where, where I, I was overwhelmed, um, but I just gritted my teeth, learned how to do it. Took the necessary steps to breathe and get through it, and I I, I did well. Um, you know, I, I delivered the product and it went okay. Um, I did one one project. Um, knock on wood, I've been fortunate to have one project where is a out of state company across across the states, um, and uh, the communication wasn't great. It was a huge learning curve. This was this was kind of when I first started. And uh, I asked for a mood board, and, and they're like, whatever whatever you do, we've seen your work, we love it. So I was like, well, okay, I'm going to just interpret what you kind of want, and I'm going to just bring my own creativity to it. And I did, and uh, it wasn't what they wanted. Mm. It was like, well, these are a little too um, this or a little too that. I'm like, well, that's where communication with your client is key and that was a huge learning experience something so subjective as art without them saying concisely right i want this i want it there i want this exposure right. but it's like i right. want it to feel like yeah a so water you mountain. have and to really like, and, and a lot of times they don't know what they want and, and they just know what they don't want you have to kind of educate them yeah. or steer them in, in yeah. a way in a sense to to kind of convey a vision 
or uh, you know a, a template of what they want, and you build on that. So that was a huge learning experience, and we both walked away unscathed, and and we we met in the middle and made it happen. But so y'all reconciled. We and reconciled. Were able to give a I was like, did. no, no one got sued that day. But um, <laughs> it have was, you been it was sued fear. before? No, no, oh, I was. I haven't. Knock on wood. But good. um, but the, the the it is always a thing. You know, if you don't do your due diligence and ask ask you know for one hundred percent, you know, communication in between and try to get a creative feel. Uh, yeah, things can really bite you in the ass. You scared the fuck out of me one day. I was like, John, I'm gonna go shoot this wedding. Any advice? Don't get sued. All right, so I'm gonna call the bride back and be like, oh, sorry, but well, I'm under professional <laughs> professional advice. No, I'm just kidding. I totally shot the wedding and it was very mediocre. Awesome. Yeah, you know, I did what I could. I think that was. I think you hit me up around a time. Um, you were just sick of people. I did have an SD you. card. I did have an SD card fail on a wedding client. Oh no! So full disclosure, not a lot of people know this, but I did have. Um, no, trust me. After this video airs, not a lot of people will know this. I had, <laughs> I had a I had a SD card uh, S, um, fail. On, I have t I use two cameras when I shoot. I have one fitted with a wide angle lens and one with a. a a long lens so I can I don't have to switch lenses I can just boom 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 one camera uh, my long lens camera which I use the most the SD card failed and I didn't realize it till after when I uploaded the oh photos. no and they were out of state and oh no um they were I was literally physically sick um for two days um prior to me summoning up the balls to tell them that I lost three quarters of your wedding. All right, so let's slow it down. How did that conversation go? It was horrible. Uh, <laughs> a grown man. Uh, That's what I wanted to hear. Grown man, big, big um, uh, motorcycle manufacturer, uh, custom motorcycle guy. Um, I, I, I brought him to tears, which in turn made me just feel like the smallest person on earth. He um, was the groom? Yeah. Okay. And his wife was also... Um, the groom. It was also her maternity shoot. So it was two milestones in one. This was this was on his first learning. Um, mm. So uh, what I did is I told him I was at their disposal. You know, I'd come up to North Carolina where they lived. I'd do anything, anything on earth that I in within my power to to recreate the shoot. Uh, I talked to the wedding company. They they booked through it, and I said I'll pay for you to. I, I won't. You know, I'll pay to my extent. If you guys can come back, I will hire the wedding company to reset up for you. Well, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. She's like, well, she can't fit in her dress. We're about it. You know, after after oh, about shit. a couple of weeks, he, he calmed down, realized I was genuine, and realized I truly just screwed You were just up. trying to make it, it work. Was, it was one of those things that couldn't be helped. Um, now, of course, I shoot with two SD cards in each camera. At the time, I wasn't. And so I have three ways of backup no matter what. So this will never happen I've again. I've never heard about an SD and I card thought, failing. I thought that they were going to sue. I thought they were going to leave. In the review-based society, that's another thing that we want should talk about is, is as a photographer, especially of personal services such as weddings, um, family portraits, stuff like that, um, reviews are, are... That's currency. It's currency. Yeah. And so I've, I've never had a bad review, but... but they could kill me with that one. I ruined their mile, two milestones. So, Damn. The bottom line is, the, graciously, they were. I was blessed enough that they were genuine people as well, and uh, they came back a year later. You stuffed and a pillow up her fucking wedding no, dress. No, no. Like she had the baby. Bonk. She had the baby, oh. and I gave them two free shoots. We recreated their a wedding to an extent, and then we did a big family portrait. Well, that's. And so they got two free it's shoots cool both of for the one, and they're extremely happy. Left me an awesome review. That's and now we're friends for life. Every time they come down, um, in fact, they're coming down in April. We're going to do more family portraits. So they've been now they've become clients for life. Adversity so builds all, a fucking bond, dude. It's all about how you handle a situation. Mm. I could have been like, well, shit happens, you know. <laughs> yeah. which, which you know, part of me was like, you know, I can't believe it happened. Um, 
And then he could have also just been like, I'll see you in court immediately. Who could have blamed him? You know, I ruined his, I mean, it's a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. What does the SD card failing even look like? It just isn't, it just isn't transferring the data onto the card? It just, it just burnt out. Um, And that's why every every year I, I switch out. When I buy a new SD card, I write the date. And after 12 months, I'll I'll, re- I'll just keep it keep it in in a cycle basically. Um, but I, wow. my cameras um, 5D series um, allow me, you know, a compact flash card and a and a micro uh, SD10 card. So I, I use both, and they write simultaneously. So if one crashes. The other one is still yeah good. yeah so smart learning learning so it was a huge learning curve mm-hmm. and and we came out unscathed but there for about there for about two weeks I was a miserable wreck you were like diarrhea puking up pretty much I was shaking and sweating oh I can't imagine I would be I would be mortified that had to have been one of the toughest calls you've ever made it in was, your life dude it was it was one of the hardest times I've ever I, I, I almost quit I was, I just it it almost killed me like. And had they been anyone else, they could have ruined me. And I'm telling you this um, just for your own learn. If you're learning photography and uh, if you're wanting to hire me, I uh, I back everything You'll up. make it right. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that too, yeah. It won't ever happen again because I back everything up. Uh, repetition is key to success. And uh, if you do one shoot, uh, you do them all the same or uh, you will fail. You need that that checklist or that you consistent have a mental, setup. It becomes every muscle time. memory, yeah, but, yeah. but yeah, it does. It does, and then I, I go straight back, dump everything on a rave drive. Um, you know, I've even had a hard drive crash. Um, I've I've been through all of it, so I've learned to necessary steps. I have struggles even just with simple video production, yeah. where after the fact, it's like, oh, I wasn't using this microphone. I was mm-hmm. using the microphone mm-hmm. on the webcam, or just like it's one little click of a button changes so everything. So many things to, uh-huh. to consider, and some someone that has suffers from ADD, like mm. I've had ADD my whole life, and uh, so I have. If it's been a huge, huge learning curve, where some people are just like, oh, I just do it. It's me. I have to like mental checklist yeah um, it's non-stop non-stop checklists i live and breathe by by literally to-do lists till they become muscle memory i'm um, sorry i want to i want to switch gears here because i know that you are a game of thrones fan and i actually think you you turned your parents on to the show is that right was that you no, I, I started to till uh, the incest. Oh, came yeah, up okay. Like, oh, we can't watch this. Okay, you tried. You tried. tried. I tried to hard. Yeah, you get a couple episodes knew, in and you I realize they you're either get, in or you're I know out. if they could get over that and realize, come on, everybody used to be cousin fuckers back in the day. Yeah, it's hard to look your mother in the eyes and be like, incest ain't that bad. <laughs> I mean, I've had to do it a couple times. So you know what I mean. So no, they're not separate fans. from Game of Thrones. Yeah, they're not just fans. in our personal. Um, uh, I, I I am. You are. Yeah. Are you a HBO subscriber? I am. True so, Detective. Oh, dude, have you been watching High that? Maintenance. Barry. Uh, I haven't watched Barry. It's good. It is. I, I'm. Sh- I, I've heard it's good. But True Detective. I love it. Well, season one. Season Never three. seen it. So. Good. I hear it's fantastic. So good. Um, and then uh, I love high maintenance. Did you watch Sharp Objects mm-hmm. with Amy Adams? That was really good. I will say this: I don't have a lot of time, so I have I'm like very selective. Yeah. I miss out on a lot. Uh-huh. Um, like even Game of Thrones. Like I wasn't a I wasn't I didn't watch it till maybe two years ago. I'm saying, I just don't have time for. Years. I don't have time for. Till I was finally like forced to like sit down, and once I started watching, I was like, oh my. And you're locked in. You're and all the way. I up just through. like cancel my appointments for the next two weeks, <laughs> um, and I just tried. I'm kind of made it happen. So I'm kind of a cheater in the sense like I remember more because I binge watched it so much recently. Whereas people that have been watching it for years are like, oh yeah, I forgot that dude was dead. See that happening when you watch it week to week. You have that whole water cooler mm-hmm. conversation for six days that we didn't have. We didn't have. We're and just I, consuming I, I it back plan, to back. I keep telling myself I'm going to I'm gonna start over if I can just find the time. 
you know, watch it again. I'm, but, I'm on season three right now um, for rewatch. It'll be my third time watching the show. We'll see. That's what I'm saying. But I did the same thing with True Detective. Mm-hmm. I, I was like, mm, uh, I just don't have time for it. I'll, I'll, I'll watch an episode. I watched one. I was like, whoa. The, first, the, thir- the third season. And then I, we finished that, and I, I, I watched the first season. I binge-watched it, like, in... Know, day, a couple of days. Well, and they're they're so uh, good. It doesn't matter. You could watch it in any order you want to, because yeah. they're not related stories. Oh yeah, the seasons are not related. As far goes um, the same way, and right. I think it's great because right. of they're that. They're not related. They're not related. It never gets daunting. Like if they're like, "Oh, Spargo is great. I'm on season 13." It's like I will never see that. Well, actually, actually, it's, it's not the 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 season one and season two same universe, and so. They kind of give reference to the two detectives several years back. That's yeah, not yeah, a yeah. similar case. Okay. So in that sense, but not 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 related. Um, but just so well done. Um, it makes you realize, wow, did this really happen, or it could really happen? And, and acting and from from uh, it was just really awesome. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna lie, dude. I gotta piss. So let's wrap this up. Before we do, who do you want to see on the Iron Throne? Has to be a character from Game of Thrones. You can't pick yourself. It's as much as I love to see you on the Iron Throne. My dad. <laughs> Good answer. Good um, answer. He deserves it more than anybody. <laughs> uh, I kind of want to see Jon Snow. I mean, not to be basic or anything. A basic bro. That's cool. I guess we'll go out on that now, dude. It's fine. But... I mean... Jon <laughs> Snow... It's and a good Kal- answer. Jon Snow and Khaleesi kind of... Have proven their salt. Mm-hmm. Jon Snow, you know, crawl over that big giant pile of dead bodies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, he's been through a lot of crap. Mm-hmm. He grew up as a, as you know, what he thought was an orphan, a bastard. I don't know. I don't mean to be a basic bro, but Jon Snow. It's a good answer. Jon it's Snow. a good answer. I know there's a lot of Khaleesi people out there. You know, obviously. I think the difference between Jon and Khaleesi is that John was a reluctant leader. He always had leadership thrust upon him. Yeah. Where ever since the beginning, Khaleesi or, or Daenerys Targaryen believed that she was entitled to the throne. And I think fundamentally they are such different characters that narratively, Jon Snow's got to be the one on the throne. It would not make sense for the person who was like, that's my throne, that's my throne, that's my throne, to actually get the throne. I I would not be surprised if Cersei ends up I on think the his throne. humility and his, his the humbleness about it, I think he uh, would make the best leader. Mm. But then again, we've seen what happens to half the people on that show that you think, oh, this person's a good person, they, <laughs> yeah, they die. Get. Um, so... I'll leave it up to the the, uh, the writers, but uh, yeah, I would I would I would have to say Jon Snow and Khaleesi, but uh, together, joint, fire, a song of ice and fire. But uh, yeah, yeah. Well, own it, dude. Fucking yeah! Oh, thanks for coming by. Yeah, bro. Uh, and thank you guys for coming by. We appreciate the business. Thanks for putting up with whatever. Um, shit. Wouldn't it be cool if I could like stick this in my mouth and it fucking light up? <laughs> Anyways, don't even know what that was about. <laughs> if you enjoyed this video, do us a favor. Smash that thumbs up button, click the bell to enable notifications, and send a link to your mama. And until next time, and on behalf of me and John Starrett, be terrible.